Hi, I'm Stacy Spencer, one of the professors here at MCUTS, Memphis Center for Urban Theological Studies, one of the best places on the planet because I get a chance to pour in and to train promising leaders in the church and in ministries all across this city. So listen, come on in and check us out as we get started in class. I would like to start out by giving us a context for our city because this is where we do ministry. In our cities, like a lot of cities that we're going to talk about uh, in the Bible, but let me just start out by giving us an overview of our city, and I'll bet some of you have never heard this information. For instance, when was our city founded? Anybody know? 1819. You said 1820, didn't you? 1860. <laughs> 1819. There were three founders of the city. Anybody know their names? No, no, he's a mayor. In the, in the 20th century. John Overton, Overton Park. Mm. James Winchester, Winchester Boulevard. Mm. And Andrew Jackson, a president from Old Hickory in Jackson Avenue. So three men founded the city in 1819. One was a president, Andrew Jackson, John Overton, and James Winchester. That's 18, I'm just giving you a real broad brush stroke. In 1858, now this is just prior, of course, to the Civil War. But in 1858, Memphis had a population roughly of 22,000 people. And it was the second largest city in the South behind New Orleans. It was really neck and neck with New Orleans, much bigger than Atlanta or Nashville. There was a huge slave auction here in Memphis. Auction Street downtown is where slaves were auctioned. And the reason it was a huge slave auction here is because of the cotton industry and the cotton farms in the Delta, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee. So there's a huge slave population in the, in the Delta, as we all know. And because Memphis was uh, a tr it, and is still a distribution center because of the river, the slave auction was here because people could be uh, shipped here from, this, uh, from New Orleans. Slaves would come over on the, on the uh, passage, uh, stop in Haiti, Dominican Republic, the Bahamas or whatever, and then come into New Orleans, and then they would be shipped by boat uh, up the river and then sold at various auctions. Now, the white population in Memphis, uh, its founding population, was primarily German and Irish. Irish from the potato famine and Germans who immigrated here in the 1800s. So the white population was primarily German and Irish, and it was a rough-and-tumble river city. Um, because of the barges and the, uh, the travel, uh, the, the uh, navigation on the river and, and the stuff and the, the cotton and so forth that was shipped up and down the river, uh, downtown Memphis was a place you didn't go unless you were packing. It was tough. A lot of, a lot of uh, prost homes, <coughs> houses of prostitution, bars and so forth, and people would you know, come overnight and they'd be gone the next day and they'd get drunk and they'd carry on all kind of fights and riots and all kind of stuff down. You didn't go downtown Memphis back in the 1850s. It was a rough and tough river city. Uh, very much like Corinth. Corinth, as you know, uh, sits at an isthmus uh, right at the, the, the southern tip of Greece, but there's a, there was actually a, a canal that they built between the, uh, the two, the Mediterranean. You have the Adriatic Sea on one side, which is really part of the Mediterranean. You had another. And so they would, instead of going uh, around Greece, they'd go through on a pan, actually would bring the boats over on logs and have horses and so forth pull them. So that it had cut off days and days of sailing around the, the tip of Greece. And Corinth was a river town too. And that's why if you start looking in, if you, if you decide to study the church at Corinth, you'll see a lot of similarities in uh, the river city of Memphis in 1858 and Corinth in the first century. Now, the city experienced tremendous growth up until the Civil War and rose to a population of 50,000 people. Tremendous growth. A lot of that growth was slave population. Memphis has always been a city in black and white. Now, it's increasingly becoming more diverse than that. But Memphis has almost been 50-50 black and white from the Civil War. A lot of that because of the slave holdings in the Delta and in Memphis. Uh, at that time, we were twice the size of Atlanta and twice the size of Nashville and neck and neck with New Orleans. Many people thought Memphis would be the capital of the South because of our distribution center. But then a series of things began to happen 
that almost destroyed Memphis, Tennessee. After the Emancipation Proclamation and during the Civil War, Memphis was taken over by Union troops at the beginning. Memphis was occupied by the Union Army almost from the very beginning of the Civil War. After the Battle of Shiloh, Memphis fell in what's called the Battle of the Mississippi. Union gunboats came down, came, came down the Mississippi uh, and they were metal boats, steel. The, the bo boats of the Confederacy were wooden boats with bales of cotton around to absorb the cannonballs. No contest. It lasted 75 minutes or so. People actually would sit out on the bluff and watch the battle. And the Confederacy was destroyed and Union Army then occupied the city of Memphis. And of course, uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant actually headquartered here, uh, down on South Memphis, uh, not far from the Pyramid, where he had his headquarters. Now when that happened and the Emancipation, happened, and Emancipation Proclamation was declared by Lincoln, the slaves that were in Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, all came to Memphis. Why? Protection. The Union Army was here. Jobs. The Union Army gave them jobs. They had security. They, didn't, they weren't too secure out in the plantations once the Emancipation Proclamation was proclaimed because they didn't observe it in the South, obviously. It had to be enforced by the Union Army. So Memphis populations uh, swelled up with African-American slaves that were seeking asylum and protection. And so, uh, so uh, 15,000 freed slaves came to Memphis. Overnight, 15,000. Um, in 1866, the Union Army reduced its forces in Memphis as the war was winding down. And as Sherman started his march to the sea and destroyed Atlanta. Um, and while, when that happened, we had the largest, uh, supposedly the largest race ride in Memphis in the uh, 19th century. Uh, whites fed up with uh, the Union Army, took it upon themselves and lynched 44 African Americans in the span of two or three days in the city of Memphis. One of the wor nation's worst race riots of the, of the 19th century. Then we had an 18, and so, um, but this, that, that was a horrible blemish on Memphis's, but, but Memphis still had 50,000 people, still a growing city. But then we had three yellow fever epidemics, 1878, 79, and 80. And much like Katrina in New Orleans, the wealthy fled the city. Anyone that could leave left. So in, 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 in the, worst, uh, the worst epidemic was July 19, uh, 1878. So in July of 1878, the population of Memphis still stood at around 50,000 people. By October, by October, it was reduced to 20,000. Half, more than half the population left or died in the city. Uh, and now the population was majority African American. Now, interestingly enough, African Americans were immune to the yellow fever epidemic, or more immune than their white counterparts. Anybody guess why? 17,000 people got yellow fever, and of that number, 90% were white. The reason is Africans, Americans had immunity because the mosquito came from Africa on the slave ships. Wow. Whites that were living here were not immune, and so they caught the fever at record numbers, while African Americans were largely immune from the disease. They stayed behind and took care of the white folks and the other folks that died. And so we lost our city charter as a, as a city, uh, so we were no longer a city of Memphis. We were a, uh, an unincorporated area because we lost all our taxation uh, we lost, uh, lost our taxes, lost our population. No one thought Memphis would recover. A lot of people didn't think New Orleans would recover. It did. So Memphis lost its charter. Interesting in 1879, interestingly enough, it was Robert Church, the first black millionaire in the South, and a freed slave, who bought bonds that made it possible for Memphis to regain its charter in 1880. You ever been to Church Park? Robert Church Park downtown. He built a, uh, built a park for African Americans. Robert Church was a shrewd businessman, a real estate owner, and uh, he bought land during the yellow fever epidemic 
and became a very rich person and a real, uh, a real leader in the city of Memphis. So he bought the charter back or put up the bond, money for the bonds and Memphis again was on the move. So the 20th century saw Memphis begin to grow again. The cause of yellow fever was discovered. It was the mosquito that carried it. People thought it was carried by clothing or through sneezing or something. It was actually carried by the mosquito biting an infected person and then carrying it to somebody else. Memphis had really one of the first developed sewer systems in the United States. A uh, very advanced sewer system for that day. We were very creative people. And we began, and we also discovered something very important even in Memphis today. We, are, we discovered the artesian wells deep within the uh, underground. Uh, when people, I have friends that will come to Memphis and they'll see me get a glass of water out of the tap and look at me like I got three eyes. <laughs> now I used to live in LA when I did uh, seminary work at Fuller Seminary. And uh, believe me, when you, when you drew water out of the tap in L.A., you couldn't see through it. And I always wondered why every house you went into, they had one of those big things, you know, a big bottle of water sitting on a deal. I said, why would anybody have that when you drink water out of the tap? And then I tasted the water, now I know. <laughs> yeah. Anyone make coffee with it. It's horrible. But we've discovered these artesian wells. And, uh, and you do know that, uh, there's, that they bottle actually Memphis water right out of the tap and sell it in bottles. For like a dollar and a quarter, right? Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that interesting? I, literally, I had people from California came to visit us. Some of our good friends from back in those days came to visit us last spring, and they, they, they just kept talking about the water. I said, it's just water. They said, we've never seen anything like You can see through it. It tastes good. It doesn't have an aftertaste. It's incredible. I was just, it was just kind of funny. So we wiped out, uh, we, uh, because we... Uh, Create a sewer system, found, we started draining swamp lands, we got rid of the yellow fever epidemic. Um, and, but at that point on, even though Jim Crow ruled the day in terms of after the emancipation, you all know what Jim Crow is, so that still ruled the day in terms of, it was basically a, a America's apartheid, right? But the city was half black, half white uh, in those days. Now, someone mentioned Boss Crump, E.H. Crump. He became mayor uh, in the 20th century, and he was, uh, then he became city finance director for 35 years. Now, he only won, he won one term as mayor, then he ran again as mayor, and he got impeached. And the reason he got impeached is because he would not, uh, he would not enforce, he would not enforce um, prohibition. He said, if you, if you quit the liquor running in Memphis, we'll go bankrupt. <laughs> I mean, we got Beale Street, we got the bars downtown. I, know, I ain't doing enough prohibition stuff, so I impeached him in Nashville. And he actually was, became then a uh, 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 congressman, you know, two years. But when he moved to Washington, if you know anything about D. Washington, when you become a congressman or a senator, but primarily a congressman from your district, uh, in that office where the congressmen have their offices, if you're a rookie congressman, you're on the bottom floor in the basement. Boss Crump ain't going to be in no basement. See, after two years, he said, I'm not doing this anymore. He came back to Memphis and became the city finance director. He owned the largest insurance company. So if you want to do business in Memphis, you had to have business insurance. And he was the finance director for the city that gave you your license. He became a very wealthy man. That's why they called him boss. No one got elected mayor except that he put him in, in that position. Crump Stadium, named after Boss Crump. Crump Boulevard, named after Crump. And he ruled the city for close to 40 years. Um, and he put Memphis on the map. Uh, he was truly the boss. Uh, he knew everybody in D.C. He was well connected. We also, for years and years, were known as the cleanest city in America. Yeah. Boss Crump did some very amazing things. Uh, we, we, we got the, the uh, cleanest city award. I remember when I was a kid, uh, uh, and I, I won't tell you how old, but in the 50s and 60s, uh, <laughs> Every year, the Post Magazine, we were the cleanest city, the quietest city. We didn't have much violence. This was this, I mean, part of this because he ruled with an iron, iron thumb. So it was uh, interesting days with Boss Crump. Um, he certainly was a racist. He was a benevolent sort of racist. He believed that everybody ought to make money, but blacks ought to make money only in the black community. Whites could do business in the black community. Black folks couldn't do business in the white community. 
He named Orange Mound as the business community for blacks, for African Americans. So Orange Mound was the cultural center of the city of Memphis. It was known by many people as the Harlem of the South. Um, music, movies, theater, uh, the um, uh, pastors, lawyers, doctors, chiefs, Indians, all that kind of group. Orange Mound was the place to be. Orange Mound is the largest and oldest African-American community this side of Harlem and had a very proud and rich heritage. And so that was named as the business district. In 1937, there was the Great Mississippi Flood, and that's what they call it, the Great Flood. And that drove another wave of refugees to Memphis because before the levees and the uh, Corps of Engineers began to build levees and try to control the Mississippi River, in the spring it always flooded. Well, in 1937, the flood was so bad, people lost everything. No flood insurance. And a lot of these were sharecroppers, black and white. And so they fled to Memphis, and they lived at the fairgrounds, 100,000 people. 60,000 stayed. Now you get a little picture, if you begin to follow this, some of the demographics and economic issues we have to this day. This is only 1937. You had... You had half the population was freed slaves with no education, not even allowed to have education. And the only African Americans after the Civil War that could get education were the elite because they could, there were only a few African American colleges, right? There was Lemoyne Owen, which didn't even exist back in the 1800s. You had Fisk and you had uh, Rust and you had these colleges, but they were very small and very hard to get into, very competitive. And so very few African Americans had any opportunity for an education. And then after the great flood, who came to Memphis with every, they lost everything. These were poor whites and poor blacks. And so we have some of the same economic issues in terms of poverty today, which is generational. And so that's a little bit of our history with the, with the great flood. Everything was destroyed. Um, the, uh, we had freed slaves, we had rural whites that had to flee to the city and live to the fairgrounds. 60,000 of them stayed with other African Americans. Three yellow fever epidemics, racial tension in Memphis like it was all over the South, particularly with Jim Crow. Um, and uh, finally everything erupts in 1967, 1968 with the sanitation strike. Sanitation wor workers worked for dollars a day uh, were not allowed to shower at the headquarters where whites were allowed to shower before they went home. Sanitation workers would be carrying garbage all day and have to go home in their coveralls, on the bus, stinking to high heaven. And in those days, in the, uh, in the 60s, the garbage was not in those nice little green plastic things. They were in aluminum tubs. And so what you did, you threw your garbage in an aluminum tub and the worker would put that on his shoulder and carry it out to the truck. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine what that was like in a 100 degree summer heat mm -hmm. with all that stuff oozing all over you. And so the African Americans uh, began to uh, ask for a, a union. Uh, then mayor was uh, Loeb, Henry Loeb, who denied a union and dug his heels in and said, no way is that gonna happen here. And as the tension mounted, uh, we then get to the time that Dr. King decided he would have to come to Memphis. Now, his people did not want him to come to Memphis. They wanted him to concentrate on the Poor People's March, which he was organizing. He was supposed to come the first time in March of 1968. To, and, and the march was scheduled uh, from Claiborne to City Hall in demands for a union uh, with a peaceful march. King was slated to be here. And then we had the largest snowstorm Memphis has ever had with 22 inches of snow. Airport got closed. You know, we, got, we, you know we have one snow, uh, snow plow in Memphis. We have one at the airport. We don't need a snow plow. Atlanta didn't have a snow plow. He was flying from Atlanta. Everything's closed down. We couldn't get into Memphis. So the march was canceled. No one could get out. I remember I was in, uh, I was in the uh, 10th grade and school was closed for an entire week. So he rescheduled his trip for April the 3rd and 4th of that same year. But when he came back, security was lax because it was scheduled last minute. There was no security at the Lorraine Hotel when he was gunned down. 
And Memphis is now, even today, even to this day, known as the place where Dr. King was killed. Um, well, today, we're the 21st largest city in the United States. We, we lost our position. We were 19th. Memphis is losing population to the suburbs, like a lot of cities, but people are moving back as well. Our fastest growing zip code in the city of Memphis is downtown. Downtown, actually downtown and midtown. Cooper Young, this area here, and downtown. So the fastest growing zip code is downtown. People are regentrifying, taking old warehouses, making them condos, and so forth. And we are the largest African American city in the United States. We're the largest city with a majority African American population. Now that's a quick history of your city. Did you learn anything? Give you a little perspective on racial tension, a little perspective on poverty, on classism. These things don't happen overnight. These, ha these things happen over generations. And so it's important to know our history. So the question is, is there a biblical theology of the city? Does God care about cities? Well, let me make a few points here. Over half of America, over half of America, 50% of all Americans, we have about 330 million people in America. Over half of them live in 41 cities, and Memphis is one of those. As a metropolitan area, we're the 41st largest metropolitan area. We're the 21st largest city. We're about the size of Pittsburgh, San Francisco, uh, Portland, in terms of our city limits. Our metropolitan, MSA, of course, it would include Kyrieville, Germantown, South, uh, what, what we call South Memphis, which other folks call North Mississippi, uh, West Memphis, and so forth. Marion, Arkansas, that's our MSA, a Metropolitan Statistical uh, Group. So 50% of all America lives in 41 places. And in fact, 80%, get this, 80%, anyone can quit, qu quickly do the math, what's 80% of 330 million? 80% of America lives in cities of 50,000 or more. So we have become an urban nation. And at the turn of the century, in 1900, end of 1800, 5% of all America lived in the cities. We've seen a massive urbanization from 5% of our population to 80% living in the cities of 50,000 or more in just a little over 100 years. And that's not only true for Memphis, it's true for the world, which I will point out. Um, now, if God is sovereign, which he is, which means he's all-powerful in control, right? He's the God of the universe, right? King Jesus. Then the question I have to ask, and we ask ourselves theologically, is he up to something? What did he end, what did he say right before his ascension to the disciples? He tells them, go to all the nations. All ethnos, that word is ethnic groups, all ethnos, ethnos, right? And tell them about me, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you even to the ends of the age. And then we begin to think, now the world's come to cities because we wouldn't go to them. Think about that. I can show you, I can take you right out today, and I can introduce you to Haitians, Dominicans, Liberians, Nigerians, Saudis, Assyrians, Iraqis, Afghanis, Iranians, Germans, uh, Romanians. I could, I could within an hour introduce to you every one of those ethnic groups right here in Midtown because the world has come to cities. We're a melting pot, really true. And I wonder if God's up to something. Um, but let's think about this. Let's, we don't have to go back that far. We go all the way back to the first century. Apostle Paul, look at his missionary activity. Where did he go to plant churches? Think of, think of the letters. The letter to what? Ephesus. Ephesus. What, what, kind, what kind of city was Ephesus? Second largest city in, in the Roman Empire. Rome was the biggest. Ephesus, number two. Alexandria, number three. Antioch of Syria, number four. Jerusalem was a large city, about 500,000. Ephesus is much larger than that. Letter of the church at Ephesus, letter of the church at Corinth, letter of the church at Philippi, letter of the church at Rome, letter of the church at Col Every letter is to a city. Why do you think Paul planted churches in cities? Because Jesus is our 
Every people group's there. And if you look carefully at the Apostle Paul's missionary journey, it's interesting that the cities are on trade routes. Mm -hmm. Remember, one of the things that happened between the close of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament is you had the Roman Empire. Right. Alexander the Great first, then the Roman Empire. What Rome did was, one, they brought, they brought relative peace to the world, what we call the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. They had strong military presence. They, they had strong uh, legal precedence, courts, and so forth. So there was relative, relative peace in the world when Rome was in charge, at least until the third century. Uh, wars ceased to exist because Rome was strong. Nobody wanted to oppose them. So it was relative peace. The other thing they did is they built a whole series of roads. You can still see some of those roads, the Appian Way today. And so you literally in the Roman Empire could travel across the Roman Empire on roads. And Paul and Jesus are walking those roads. You could walk, if you were today, if you, were, you could walk some of the, the roads that Jesus walked that are still there today. And so Paul, by planting churches in Rome, knew that he could plant, then the gospel would go everywhere. Because if people got saved in Rome, or people got saved in Corinth, then the, or, or the great story is, we'll talk about it in a little bit, uh, where the guy named Philemon, remember him? The little book of Philemon? Well, he lives in Colossae. And Colossae is 100 miles north of Ephesus. Ephesus is the capital of modern-day Turkey. Millions of people. Remember, Paul's there for three years. And he preaches in, in, in this amphitheater, right? He starts in the synagogue like he always does. Then he goes to the amphitheater when the synagogue doesn't like him anymore. And one day, evidently, Philemon, who's a big landowner, because where he lives in, in Colossae, and Laodicea, remember those names? Laodicea, Colossae, Sardis, those are all in Ephesus. I mean, uh, in, in Turkey, modern-day Turkey, what was then called Asia. That would be the province of Asia uh, in New Testament language, New Testament times. It's not, it's Turkey today. Well, Colossae and Laodicea are, th there are three cities that were in what we call the Lycus River Valley. And the Lycus River Valley was a very fertile farm area. So Philemon was a farmer. And Colossae is a small town, but he's got to sell his produce somewhere because he can't sell it all in the river valleys. So one day he goes to Ephesus to sell his wares. And he hears about this crazy Jew who's now a Christian who was out to kill Jews preaching in the, uh, in the arena there or in the theater. So he goes and hears Paul and he comes to faith and he gets discipled by Paul. And then he goes to plant a church in Colossae. Paul never went to Colossae. Paul never went anywhere but big cities. He never went out in the countryside. Only big cities and key cities. Philippi was a key city. Thessalonica was a key city. Berea, Corinth, Athens, where he went, and Ephesus. And so Paul planted churches in these cities uh, because he knew he could reach the world, all ethnic groups. He was trying to be obedient to Jesus's call of preaching the gospel to all ethnic groups. I'm so grateful that you got a chance to peep into our class tonight. Listen, if you want to find out more about MCUTS, go to www.mcuts.org or call the number on your screen and you'll be glad you did. See you soon.